Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us on the latest ECA Learning Zone webinar, um, all about emergency lighting design and installation. Today's presentation is brought to you by ECA Commercial Associate Philip Payne. We're delighted to have their specification sales manager, Greg Owen, who will be your main presenter today. We also have ECA's technical manager, Gary Parker, who I will hand over to shortly. But before I do, I'd just like to re remind you that uh, you can use the questions box on your screen at any time during today's presentation. Our presenters will answer as many of these as they can at the end of the webinar. Um, today's session will also be recorded and the full replay will be available on ECA's YouTube channel. And uh, with that said, I hope you enjoy today's session. Gary, over to you. Thanks, Oliver. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Hopefully, everyone's keeping safe, fit, and well, and, and enjoying the relatively good weather we've been experiencing over the last few weeks. Uh, we've got a good little talk here this evening on a subject that uh, I find quite interesting. It's uh, it, it's something that we all come across in many installations, and unfortunately, it's something that a lot of contractors often fall foul on. It's a changing world, the requirements for emergency lighting has altered dramatically in the last few years and webinars and events like this are really good to keep contractors, designers up to date on the latest requirements to make sure that they don't uh, fall foul later and towards the end of a contract. So we've got Greg Owen today who's going to talk us through some of the latest changes, developments and requirements for emergency lighting and hopefully come the end of this you'll come away with a good understanding and a better knowledge than when you started. Greg, over to you. Thank you very much, Gary. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Greg Owen from Philip Payne. I'm a specification sales manager. If we could keep all questions towards the end of the presentation, there is a chat box, as you've heard. If you could put questions in there, that, that will be fantastic. So what is emergency lighting? We're going to go through five points. What is emergency lighting, legislation and standards, emergency lighting design, testing requirements, and emergency lighting technology. So what is emergency lighting? What is emergency lighting for? It is provided to enable the safe exit from a location in the event of a failure of the normal building electrical supply and to allow potentially dangerous equipment or processes to be made safe before evacuation and to ensure firefighting and safety equipment can be readily located and used. Emergency lighting is very important. Let's look at the legislation and standards regarding emergency lighting. There's a wide array of references, as you can see on your screen. If we start by having a look at the top, those highlighted in red, the Fire Precautions Act of 1971 introduced powers for the fire authority to make an application to the court to prohibit the use of premises in circumstances where they were deemed to be dangerous or a risk of fire. Building regulations, they are minimum standards for design, construction and alterations to virtually every building. You can apply to any local authority building control department or approved inspector for building regulations approval. Having a look at the references that are highlighted in green, BSE EN 1838 is a European standard that specifies the luminous requirements that have been agreed in Europe for emergency escape lighting and standby lighting systems, specifically installed in premises or locations where such systems are required. It is principally applicable to locations where the public or workers have access. BSEN 50172 and BS5266 Part 8, Emergency Escape Lighting Systems. This specifies the minimum provision and testing of emergency lighting for different premises. Additional information on servicing can be found in BS5266 Part 1, which is the, the code of practice for emergency lighting 
of premises. BSEN 60598 and 62034, we as manufacturers ensure our products and luminaires are manufactured within certain parameters to comply with legal requirements. And then lastly, BS ISO 7010 refers to a specific legend style format you'll see later in this presentation. The need for emergency lighting comes from the EC directives on health and safety. So looking at this, which is the regulatory reform order, fire safety order of 2005. So in the case of emergency lighting, this has been enacted as the regulatory reform order 2005. And the RRO was first introduced in October 2006 and was intended to rationalize and simplify much of the legislation concerning fire safety at work in England and Wales. It amended or replaced over 100 pieces of legislation, including many local authority acts and the provision of fire certificates. It replaced the fire certification under the Fire Precautions Act of 1971 with the general duty to those in control of, of buildings. The regulatory reform order becomes the legal requirement in the UK to ensure adequate emergency lighting. The UK government de devolves powers to the Scottish Parliament and the Northern Ireland Assembly as Fire Act of 2005 for Scotland and Fire Safety Regulations 2006 also for Scotland. And then the, the Fire Safety Regulations 2010 for Northern Ireland. So having a look at part one, section 5.1 in particular, legislation and regulation, who is responsible? In England, in England and Wales, the RRO defines the responsible person, Scotland refers to the duty holder, and Northern Ireland refers to the appropriate person. So the legislation places the duties defined onto the responsible person or duty holder or appropriate person. If the premises are a workplace, the responsible person is the employer. If the premises are not a workplace, the responsible person is the person who has control of the premises. And this may be the, the owner or the occupier. The same duties apply to all persons with any degree of control of premises. And this may be by means of a contract or, or even a tenancy. If control is passed to a person under contract or to a tenant, then by law, they all have the duties imposed by the various acts and regulations. Employees with any degree of control over fire safety also have all the duties imposed under law. You can see the at the bottom of the slide the gov.uk link that that's a that's a link to the government website and it has more information if you'd like to to read more part two fire safety duties the orders define the duties of persons involved in control of the premises and persons who have control have a duty under law to to take fire precautions to ensure the safety of employees, do risk assessments, so assessment of risks to eliminate these risks, and these need to be regularly reviewed to ensure that they are up to date and that the risks are eliminated, essentially. Ensure that fire detection warning and firefighting equipment is adequately provided. Emergency illumination lighting and exit signage is provided in case of failure to the normal lighting. Uh, implementing procedures and safety drills, that's very important, and ensure suitable maintenance of all protection warning and fighting equipment. And also very importantly, ensure adequate safety training to personnel is provided. Part three of the regulatory reform order of 2005, enforcement. 
This touches on the enforcing authority. And this generally means the fire and rescue authority of that local area to the premises or the health and safety executive. And we can see that the enforcing authority has the right to enter and inspect a, a building, ascertain compliant, uh, compliance with the RRO if um, the building is not up to uh, scratch the standard where it should be in terms of emergency lighting, they can uh, order an alterations notice or even a prohibition notice as well, um, enforcement notices with a time frame to carry out the measures defined. So that's that's very important. Part four, offences and appeals. The various acts and regulations make it clear that any person with any degree of control can be held accountable under law for failure to carry out their statutory duties. It is possible that an employer or owner or occupier as a corporate entity could be the responsible person. In this case, it would be their individual and joint responsibility to discharge the duties of the acts and regulations. Failure to comply can lead to fines and or imprisonment. We are familiar with law whereby we are innocent until proven guilty. However, this law states that you are guilty until proven innocent, which is quite scary. Examples of consequences. We'll just have a look at some examples. This in England uh, in April, 26th of April, 2007, we can have a look at a new look store. There, there was no risk assessment that was done inadequate staff training. Very luckily, no one was hurt or injured. And actually what, what happened was that the staff weren't even aware that their building was on fire. The fire alarm was going off. However, there was inadequate staff training that they didn't know what to do. And they were switching the alarm off. And it was folk that were across the road that actually phoned the fire brigade to notify them that the building is on fire, the first and second floor. If you have a look at the, the picture at the top left, the, the fire door release mechanisms, um, they were fitted to the wrong side of the of the exit doors. And yeah, so, so luckily no one was hurt. However, for this that happened, um, there was a very, very large fine of 400,000 pounds and compliance as well. So total that was half a million pounds. You can have a look at the link if you'd like to read more. So that's an example. There's another example in, in Scotland. Um, this was this was quite tragic that this firm or rather the, the death of a pensioner, which there was no maintenance on the emergency lighting, which led to the death of, of this poor man. Having a look at more examples, there was no emergency lighting certificate that was done here and no fire alarm maintenance, which led to 50,000 pounds. And then lastly, having a look at another one in over in Wales, which is quite recent, the 10th of September last year, a Cardiff care home. The operators were fined 400,000 pounds plus due to fire breaches, putting residents at, at serious risk. If we have a look at what they weren't complying with. Uh, there was not a, a fire risk assessment. It was inadequate, uh, insufficient smoke alarms, inaccessible and blocked fire escape routes. That's very important not to block those. That defeats the point of it. Failure to conduct appropriate evacuation drills. So there's a lot that, that we need to do to avoid this. And, and that was quite a costly uh, fine as well, um, 432,000 pounds. Moving on. The Code of Practice, which is a guidance and recommendations document, BS 5266 Part 1 refers to the Euro norms 1838 and EN 50172 for specific requirements. As a Code of Practice, this part of BS 5266 takes the form of guidance and recommendations. If there are any deviations to design for whatever reason, it needs to be justified and recorded. And, and this should not be quoted as if it were 
a specification and particular care should be taken to ensure that claims of compliance are not misleading. So if we read this together, what BS 5266 part one states, UK legislation imposes a duty on persons, including employers and other persons with control of premises to carry out risk assessments and to take such precautions as to ensure as far as reasonably practicable, the safety of the occupants. BS 5266 gives recommendations and guidance on the factors that need to be taken into account in the design, installation and wiring of electrical emergency lighting systems in order to provide the lighting performance needed for safety of people in the building in the event of failure of the normal lighting supply. That is a very long sentence. From what we've read, we've learned that BS 5266 is a UK only document. It has no application outside of the UK. Practice and recommendations in, in other EU states may vary. <clears throat> So where the standards fit, having a look, starting up at the top, the, the base guidance document, BS5266, these system standards feed into and build that, which is EN 1838 and BSEN 50172. The product standards, which manufacturers, we ensure that products are manufactured in accordance with those, uh, which I have touched on and explained about. So that's where the standards fit and, and how it all works together. The, the purpose of emergency lighting is to ensure the, that lighting is provided promptly, automatically and for a suitable time when the normal power supply to the lighting fails to ensure that people within the building can evacuate safely in the event of an emergency. We will explore the different scenarios, emergency escape lighting, safety safety lighting and and standby lighting around supply failure but just looking at this slide if, if we have a look at su supply failure there's there's three types emergency lighting safety lighting also known as stay put and standby standby and emergency lighting are very common uh, emergency lighting that we know is a minimum requirement that that buildings need Standby lighting, we will touch on and have a look in, in slides to come and we can go through some examples, but just having a look at um, different applications, you can read on the slide, for example, standby lighting that allows normal activities can continue, but additional precautions are needed to meet escape or safety requirements. So we will explore and have a look at these a bit further very soon. So where do you start? Consultation, having a look at the basic factors. How many occupants are there? Where are the escape routes? Can we get floor plans? You as the person that's responsible or the owner to map out those escape routes. Where should fire extinguishers be? Evacuation procedures. Is immediate evacuation necessary? If you're going to adopt a stay put strategy for how long that might be for an office that if there is a supply failure, but not necessarily an emergency situation, you could apply a stay put that would allow the occupants to, to be in the building, to stay put, be in the building. However, we will have a look at uh, illuminance design and what is required there. So there's a lot to think about and to go through. Um, also, a part of strategies, standby generation, is escape lighting also required? Risk assessments, who are going to do those? How can they be mitigated? If you are having to <clears throat> design emergency lighting on, on roof terraces, um, how, how are you going to mitigate risks if there's perhaps a pool on top of the roof? When it comes to test procedures, is that going to be done manually or automatically? manually is turns out to be quite difficult quite time consuming we'll have a look at uh, different uh, emergency lighting uh, testing systems and and how that can be done
consultation key stakeholders there's lots of different people that are very important that that play like equal parts in the design um, of emergency lighting within buildings there's the owner lighting designers installers occupiers building control that passes off perhaps legend formats for for exit signs architects that that get involved everyone has got um, equal importance and it is very important that just working together clearly and coming up with a with a plan that is uh, fit for purpose for the premises fit for purpose as i was touching on emergency lighting is designed to ensure safe evacuation of a building reduce panic and confusion and safely manage high risk tasks in the events of a mains power failure as a result emergency lighting can be split into three categories is escape routes open areas and high risk uh, tasks which we'll look into more the design process starting with design procedure consultation what we were touching on two slides ago design requirements establishing all locations that require emergency lighting we will have a look at specific routes at points of emphasis where you need emergency lighting where signage should be placed illuminance design detailed lighting design to determine emergency luminaire and exit sign locations that can be done by um, yourselves or as, as manufacturers, we we do get involved and, and help with that as well. But that's obviously very important. And generally having that done in, in AutoCAD, in, in CAD systems is, is very convenient to be passed over to, to the end user. System design, keeping that in mind, electrical system design, um, ensuring integrity of, of those local circuits, those, those lighting circuits um, and how the, the emergency lighting will be provided from, from that local circuit if that's going to be um, a self-contained product or powered via a central battery. So those are things to keep in mind. Design of circuit protection and testing system, installation, commissioning and operating instructions once installed and preparation of, of manuals for the installer and maintenance engineer. So that's quite important that that gets handed over to, to the end user, that they are familiar with, with what they have, how it works, how testing is performed and, and kept as that is a legal requirement. Illumination for emergency lighting conditions we'll have a look at an emergency situation and a non-emergency situation. However, under both scenarios, there is a power failure to the building. So starting with escape lighting. Escape lighting should assist occupants to, if we have a look at the points, locate and identify exit signs at doors and along exit routes use escape routes, conduct safety measures prior to evacuation, shutting down equipment, checking areas have been vacated, if there are um, any areas where those disabled people would um, need to be evacuated from, yeah, evacuate vulnerable occupants who, who require assistance and release anyone trapped in a lift. So escape lighting should assist all those points. Illumination for emergency lighting conditions, having a look at the escape route specifically. On the escape route, the illumination level should be one lux minimum, and that is specifically along the center line. Keeping a diversity ratio, or also known as uh, uniformity, of a max to min ratio of, of 40 to 1. So what this is, why that is um, in place is to avoid the use of, of a 
of a spotlight or a or a floodlight illuminating the the entire corridor from from one end. So that is where that that ratio comes in, which is um, aiming to to minimise disability glare. So that's that's quite important. Which you can, if if you look at the the image on the left hand side, there's that illumination is being provided uh, by a a downlight by a, a recessed product in in the ceiling, and that will confirm to uh, conform to to that ratio. And risk assessments of old installations is required. That's that's very important to ensure that uh, risk assessments are are always current and up to date. And this information, if we have a look at the bottom slide, uh, the bottom of the slide, DSE in 1838 of 2013, you can read more information about that. Having a look at open areas. Open areas requires emergency lighting if the area is larger than 60 meters squared or as determined by a risk assessment. So that's a general rule of thumb to work to and determined by a risk assessment. That's that's very important. So that that is the trump card here. So that that can trump this. So that's that's very important to, to keep that in mind. The illumination level is half a lux. The same diversity ratio is appropriate. And that does exclude a half a meter border around that particular room. So rooms of, of that size, that does exclude a half a meter border around that, um, which is that illumination level of, of half a lux won't be required in, in that area. Risk assessment considerations, levels of occupancy, does an escape route pass through this space? If it does, what we've learned in the previous slide is that that would need to be illuminated to at least one lux. Other risk assessment considerations, is the equipment that needs to be isolated prior to evacuation? If there is, that might require a higher illumination level of five or 15 lux depending on that task that needs to be performed or as by the, the risk assessment. Having a look at high risk areas requiring illumination. High risk area lighting requires not less than 10% of the required maintained illuminance for that task and not less than 15 lux, not all 15 lux. And so the point of this is to, um, for safe termination of hazardous activities, equipment to be shut down, that uniformity ratio is, is slightly lower. Um, duration for as long as the, the risk exists. And that might be quite challenging with um, certain luminaires if it's only got a one hour battery duration. So perhaps uh, high powered self contained LED luminaires or small central battery systems might be applicable. But most self contained products will be able to perform, um, will be able to provide that illumination. Points of emphasis having a look at this, this is quite detailed and quite important to, to keep in mind when when doing design, we can have a look at the, um, the points of emphasis. All of the de defined escape routes, changes to route direction that will require emergency lighting, and within two meters, uh, within a two meter horizontal distance, exit signs are also required at, at each change of direction as well, along the escape route towards that final exit inside and outside the final exit door. A lot of people actually forget that, which is specifically the, um, the, the point outside the final exit door. That can conveniently be, be catered for by a, a maintained product uh, in, instead of having a traditional uh, mains 230 volt product outside and a dedicated uh, non-maintained emergency luminaire, you could perhaps use one luminaire um, that has maintained to provide your mains lighting 
but then also in the event of a main's failure, that would provide the, the adequate and necessary emergency lighting to comply outside the final exit door. Things to keep in mind, smart design. Stairwells and escalators, those need to be illuminated. Toilets, uh, fire extinguisher locations, and that needs to be specifically five lux on the device, fire alarm, call point locations as well, five lux, near escape equipment for vulnerable people, and call points, including two-way uh, communication system systems and disabled toilet alarms, uh, call positions, at reception desks as well, to illuminate that in case that needs to be used to call the fire brigade. So there's a lot of uh, specific points of emphasis that need to be kept in mind when, when designing. Or, and also importantly, other locations as deemed necessary by a risk assessment. And that illumination doesn't, doesn't stop within the building. That will lead to the place of safety. So if we page through these slides, we can see that the illumination to the place of safety would generally be to the fire assembly point, which will need to provide illumination to that point. We need to illuminate any areas of high risk. For example, if, if you can think with me, if you can imagine on, on top of a roof and we need to guide those back into the building outside. If there's a swimming pool on top of the roof, we need to provide a clear escape route and illuminate the space to avoid injury of, of anyone falling into the pool or injuring themselves or any areas of risk. So that's that's very important. And that's along that escape route to that fire assembly point outside of the building specifically as well. We have put together, you can have a look at this. This is available for, for download, which is quite a convenient pack of um, that you can use that's, that's quite handy for emergency lighting design to keep in mind the escape routes, one lux, as we've gone through in, in summary, open areas, half a lux, um, high risk areas, 15 lux, escape route signs, where those need to be, illumination where emergency lighting needs to be placed and also very importantly the the final exit so that is available that you can keep when when designing having a look at a non-emergency situation but again still there is a power failure so safety lighting and safety lighting is lighting that allows occupants to remain in the building where there isn't necessarily an immediate evacuation necessary referred to as stay put. And that illumination needs to be one lux, one lux on the floor in areas where people need to move around. The safety lighting lighting must be connected to a battery that is capable of operating for at least one hour. And this is to ensure that everybody will have time to exit the premises in an emergency. Other things to keep in mind, again, risk assessments. We can't stress this enough. Um, do additional rooms or areas need to be illuminated? That must be kept in mind. Does that need to happen uh, in order to determine if a higher illumination level is required? Escape routes, uh, excuse me, escape route signs and other safety signs should still be identifiable. So moving from safety lighting, into standby lighting. So the difference here, standby lighting is that part of emergency lighting provided to enable normal activities to continue, where it is used for emergency escape lighting purposes, it must comply with requirements for escape lighting as required in BS5266. So if, if you can imagine, for example, my wife is is going to give birth quite soon and she'll be heading out to the labor ward at um at east surrey and with with the doctors or, or the midwives um during that time when she's giving birth um if you can imagine that if there were no windows or and there was no daylight entering that room and the lights went off pitch darkness standby lighting in order for that those activities what they are doing there in order for that to continue, 
standby lighting would would aid in that and that is that where lighting um, is is powered by an external source um, that it replaces the main power supply perhaps by a generator or a static inverter from a central battery so it's quite important in order for those activities to continue so that's that's quite a good example um, that's quite important however things to keep in mind the size of the room or those areas that could require standby lighting is there an escape escape route that's that's passing through there escape lighting may also still be required while while the um the backup uh, power source is going to provide lighting to that area and or in case the generator fails or or the central battery what do the luminaire labels mean manufacturers will package their products in accordance with this labeling system so if we have a look at you can have a look at the columns the types uh, x self-contained self-explanatory you can read that but going through an example perhaps of a self-contained product would denote x if it's non-maintained zero so perhaps a self-contained dali non-maintained product would read x zero a b c f 180 and that is what you would see on the packaging of of that product so you can have a look at the facilities you can read up more information as to exactly uh, what all those types of modes are and then the the duration as well we will go into the next slide which which duration to use but three hours is is the norm in in the uk and and parts of europe as well you don't generally see self-contained products that are um, going to provide illumination for for 10 minutes so which duration to use before detailed planning is commenced decisions regarding duration of emergency lighting must be made en 1838 specifies one hour minimum bs 5266 part one expands this requirement by adding that one hour duration should only be used where the premises are immediately evacuated on power failure and are not reoccupied until the system is back to full capacity. This would delay reoccupation of the building for many hours after a power failure. So three hours is, is therefore regarded as the normal duration for emergency lighting, as most premises will want to reoccupy soon after a power failure. There are requirements for places of entertainment to have a three hour duration where it is permissible to allow persons to remain in the premises for two hours, then use the remaining one hour duration to effect evacuation. However, under fire conditions, immediate evacuation will always occur. There's no cost benefits or difference really versus a three hour and it is not generally available um, so, so therefore, like a three-hour self-contained product with that battery is is generally uh, recommended, and and that is what is is available most of the time. Type of luminaire resilience. Having a look at a self-contained product, which is one that has has a battery. Pros of that, cons of a self-contained product. It's easy to specify and install equipment. There's perhaps greater flexibility, which there is. Maintenance costs are spread over time. Some cons, some are not suitable for, for conversion. Conventional wiring re requiring a, two, a 230 volt main supply to the self-contained luminaire central battery systems there's quite a lot to to keep in mind and to ensure compliance with this um, there are some good pros however having a look on on the right hand side fire resistant cables should be used that can be quite expensive mechanical protection may be needed in in some applications porcelain terminal blocks and those should be fused should be fitted in emergency luminaires if the cable 
cables loop in and out looping. That's that's quite important to to comply with as well. So the the pros on that, you can from a central battery system receive higher illumination values, perhaps a longer battery life if the central battery is maintained properly, and that will need to be inspected daily. And luminaires do not need converting. It's essentially a mains product with a mains driver on, on the end. Um, and in the event of a power failure, that circuit would then um, be powered via, via that central battery system. There are cons um, to that increased wiring uh, complexity and costs. It does need daily inspection um, and higher battery replacement costs if there were to be a fire to where that central battery system is kept. That could uh, prove to be quite an expensive exercise having to replace that. Generators as well, they are, they are widely used. Uh, again, looking at the pros, higher illumination values, luminaires do not need converting. Um, cons, you can have a look and you've most likely read that. So there's, there's a lot to choose from. There's a lot to think about. And it is all very important. Um, I think you might be getting the picture now. Generators might be applicable, perhaps for standby uh, lighting, uh, design situations. Self-contained could be very easy to use in um, in in all sorts of applications. Um, there's there's a lot to think about. Emergency lighting design. A emergency luminaire failure. To avoid that, it's been said that it is good practice um, to adopt and have a minimum of two luminaires per compartment of the escape route and, and each open uh, plan area, or one luminaire and one exit sign in the case, uh, in, in the event of a luminaire failing, then there is one, another one that will be able to provide some form of emergency lighting um, for that compartment, for that room. Having a look, moving into, into signage now, having a look at these two pictures, looking at the, at the left firstly, signage needs to be clear and unambiguous. The instructions need to be unambiguous in, in terms of where is the escape route, where's the final exits. We can see that there's, there's three signs there, one illuminated, two non-illuminated, all pointing different directions. We will explore the use of arrows in the next couple slides. I will answer, I'll tell you a bit more about that in case any of you are asking yourselves how do the arrow directions work. Having a look at the picture on the right, um, that, that ceiling has um, been installed right over that exit sign. Is that clear? No, that's not, that's not acceptable. It shouldn't have been done like that. A different product should perhaps have been used over there. That's that's not really acceptable. When it comes time to um, maintenance, when that needs to be, battery needs to be replaced or the, the light source, that's not going to be very easy to, um, to fix. Having a look at the escape routes as well, other things to keep in mind, the exit signs along the escape routes um, should be maintained where occupants may be unfamiliar with the building. It should be conspicuous and perhaps uh, considering smoke accumulation as smoke, hot air rises, smoke accumulates, it will move towards the ceiling. So perhaps mounting on the walls might be better. There are um, certain parameters with, with mounting heights on the, on the walls that um, that, that height needs to be kept in mind that we will have a look at. So the, the location of safety signs needs to be at all normal exits, at all emergency exits, along the escape routes, and anywhere else if the route to the nearest exits is, is not clear. The sign type and, and viewing distance, we can have a look at the um, the calculation to see the viewing distance, this is very important, um, the viewing distance to a sign. So if the sign is externally lit, um, the, 
the viewing distance on that would be 15 meters. If having a look at the example, if the, the height of the sign is 150 mil, um, that's just what is in place with, with regards to the it's legislation that externally lit, lit signs are, are only half of that what internally lit products are. So that, that's that's quite important to, to keep in mind when working out the viewing distance to a sign. So having a look at the internally lit sign, it would be 200 times the sign height. So if the sign is 150 millimeters tall, so the height of the sign, then that would be 200 times the 150, which provides you with 30 meters. What is quite important, keeping in mind on ex externally lit products, so one that is not internally lit, under an emergency situation that needs to be lit, uh, illuminated on the face of the product uh, to five lux, and within mains, 100 lux vertical illumination. So that's very important. We're internally lit, that will take care of itself. And then you can have a bit of a read. I won't go into too much detail. The technical features required for these signs are, and you can have a look at that information there. But all manufacturers, we will ensure that the product meets those specific requirements. So that's nothing that, that you need to worry about. Having a look, as I said, uh, the, the history of legend formats on signs, starting up from the top, the word exit has been illegal since 1999, uh, reading green on a white, back, uh, on a white background. The HTM65 NHS hospital signs that has been withdrawn. The preferred sign should be the, the ISO 7010 as at the bottom. That is specified in BSEN 5266 and BSEN ISO 7010. And that is also recommended by the Industry Committee of Emergency Lighting. Looking what is noted within red, it is good practice and it actually it should be avoided. Do not mix multiple sign formats in one building. It is important to avoid that. Uh, if in doubt, consider replacing signs to ISO, the ISO 7010 format. The use of arrows, we can have a look, progress to the right, you use a, a right arrow to the left, down and up, the, the up and down, those are where the, the majority of, of questions are asked, where to use up, where to use down. The up arrow should be used all throughout the building, unless at the immediate arrival of to progress down. So the up arrow indicates progress forward from here, progress forward and through from here, progress forward and up from here. So I'm just trying to convey that it's important to use the up and only down where it is immediately necessary to progress downwards. So for example, in an office environment on the floor plate leading into the, the stairwell core, in that office, that doorway leading into the stairwell core, an up arrow should be used and down, if you're on the first level, for example, a down arrow, or down to the left or down to the right should only be used immediately with inside that stable core at that point where to progress down. Moving into testing requirements. Inspection and testing. Regular testing and servicing is essential. That needs to be done by the, the competent person. Um, and that competent person should have authority to ensure correct testing maintenance and logging. There are uh, two very good uh, handle books that, that you can purchase from, from Amazon, um, requirements for electrical installations and electrician's guide to emergency lighting. Those are, are very useful and, and that will have that in there as well for you to read through. Handover and commissioning. After installation of the emergency lighting system, a full rated duration test after 24 hours of charging needs to be done. A completion certificate and logbook should be supplied to the owner or occupier of the premises. So there's a lot of information here and it's quite a big responsibility. 
Um, there are systems to, to take care of this. However, if it's being done manually, which in, in this day and, and century is, isn't really happening anymore, we are moving to, to automatic systems, but having a look at what needs to be done, um, there needs to be a contractual and uh, legal details need to be conveyed onto the, onto the owner or the occupier, um, calculations, drawings, commissioning information, how to use the system, operation of the system, um, spare parts and tools, perhaps where to procure that from, disposal, if certain batteries need to be disposed in a certain way. Um, so, so there's a lot that, that needs to be passed on to the, um, the end user during the handover and commissioning stage. Testing. Testing, legal testing requirements. A monthly duration test, which is a short duration test known as the function test, needs to be performed monthly, and that is to ensure that all emergency luminaires illuminate correctly. Lamps and batteries are working to ensure that the light source can be powered by the, by the battery in an emergency situation. And annually, a full duration test of that luminaire needs to be discharged to test that it works correctly, and that needs to be recorded. And daily, that will apply to central battery cabinets only, visual inspections to ensure the system is in a ready condition. Very important, that needs to be, um, those tests need to be done and ne they need to be recorded and kept in, um, in some fashion for, for that to be viewed by perhaps the, the inspectors or those that are going to ascertain that compliance. So that's quite important. So record keeping, as I was saying, the competent person signs regular test certificates. So this can, Proved to be quite a this can this could be quite an overwhelming task if, if you have quite a large building, hotels, schools, or any building actually, um, just doing all of these tests and keeping a record of that. Um, there are systems that that can do this for you that we will have a look at shortly. So more about record keeping, all testing records and logbooks must be kept in a safe place, readily available for examination. Emergency lighting technology, what technology is available now? LEDs for emergency lighting, providing they provide good light outputs, uh, longer, long, longer life, uh, low power consumption. LEDs are, are the way forward. They can be controlled with lenses and optics for, for greater spacings, ultimately leading to fewer points along the escape routes. Long life. Um, it, just having a look at a comparison of a an LED uh, that will provide 100,000 hours if it's working on a, a 4 watt LED strip versus a T5 8 watt fluorescent lamp providing 4,000 hours. So it's it's a no-brainer. Moving towards LED is is the way forward, and that would provide greater spacings and output. So looking at that example of uh, uniformity along the escape routes using a downlighter such as this product over here. You can have a look at um, lens technology to optimize light distribution. Um, a standard product using the 200 lumen output would provide approximately six meter spacings. You can have a look at the photometrics and the spacing tables that are available on the website uh, using an, an area lens, greater spacing, and specifically a corridor lens providing 20 meter spacing. And just to reiterate, that would be spacing between luminaire to luminaire or wall to luminaire um, on the transverse. So that information is available to have a look at. What's available in terms of the in terms of the testing? So this what's available is the is the control gear of, of a product specifically. Having a look at these options. So what's available? Option one, doing manual testing. The pros to do manual testing, it's easy to specify and install equipment, attractive capital costs. So an example here would be having a product that has a basic non-maintained or maintained module, but, but that's it. So to do that manual testing, typically via a key switch to isolate the, the main supply in order to, to check that the product, if it's, if it's self-contained, that it does illuminate the monthly function test and the annual duration test. So that is what option one is. That's what manual testing is. Option two, auto test. 
can look at the pros and the cons. An auto test would be a, a Lumine that uh, makes use of a, an auto test driver that automatically would commission itself once installed and it would automatically carry out its monthly and annual duration test. So all you would need to do is look out for the, the red LEDs and that would indicate if it's flashing or if it's a solid red LED, if that's a battery failure, that would tell you if the Luminaire is, is healthy or not. However, keep in mind with option one, option two, those records need to be kept manually, which could be quite tedious. Option three, preferable in, in my opinion, uh, auto test and networked systems. They are reliable, they uh, minimal labor costs, proactive offsite record keeping, that which is DALI systems, digital addressable lighting interface systems, will provide the, the testing and the control of those emergency luminaires on site that the tests and those records can be kept um, off site and they can specifically happen automatically, which is taking that convenience, which is pro providing that convenience. Wireless automatic testing systems are, are allowed. They are systems that are in accordance with BSEN 62034, which provides the convenience of um, the possibility for for full off-site record keeping to the cloud. There's a lot of uh, buildings that have made use of, of these great systems, which, which are working really well. So going into, this is now going into the, the technology of um, the, the, wireless, the wireless systems for automatic testing. So this will be a very short video that we can listen to. If you have maintaining, you'll notice legal requirements can be a real headache. You have to make sure there's emergency lighting in every building. Then you have to worry about whether it's inspected and tested every month. On top of which, you have to have added testing and maintenance can leave you feeling overwhelmed. Introducing Specto XT. Philip Pets fully automated emergency lighting system. The Specto XT emergency system uses the latest technology efficiently automate testing and record keeping, reduce the number of installation points, and extend battery life. That requires a five warranty. Installation is simple. Specto XT communicates via wireless technology and connects into your pre existing main supply. Our Spectre XT gateway also checks the status of each luminaire daily and reports to the Spectre XT website, which can be accessed on any device with an internet connection at any time. So give us a call today and see what Spectre XT can do for you. Philip Payne, specialist emergency lighting designers, manufacturers and suppliers since 1968. So that was an overview on Spectre XT. There's one more video. Let's have a look at this and this is this is specifically the the system of the Spectre XT website. So let's play this, and then th this meeting is is coming to an end very shortly. The Spectre XT website is the primary user interface to the Spectre XT system. One of the main benefits is that it can be accessed on any internet multiple or remote sites because they don't need to be in the building to access the emergency lighting test reports. Display the data, the installed emergency lighting system, ensuring compliance with colors is that time schedules for emergency lighting testing are quickly and simply configured on the website so users don't need to be in the building to make adjustments. The website scores the aspect installation drawings, keeping the records on site readily available when needed. Spectro XT generates monthly status reports via email. Users can choose their instant email notification to inform them if any items need attention. For more information, please contact us. Discover how the Spectro 
Hello everyone. Sorry about that. I think there was a that video wasn't streaming very well. Sorry for wasting your time there. If you would like to have a look at that video, it is available on the website that you can have a look at. But thank you very much for, for listening and joining on this call. That does bring us to the end of, of this presentation. Thank, thank you very much. Just one last point. Your feedback is, is important to us. So my name, my email address, if you would like to provide some feedback on the session, if, if you pull out your, your mobile phone, open up your camera and you point it to that QR code, there'll be a very short feedback form for you to fill in. And also importantly, if you would like a certificate from the session, you can either send me an email and then I will obtain your, your name and your email address in order to provide you with that certificate. Or if you fill in that feedback form, your name, your email address, then there'll be a record of that and we can get back to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for that very much. Um, I don't think we've got any questions at the moment. Um, yeah, I don't think there's any any questions coming through. Um, unless anyone wants to add any questions before we. That's not a problem. If there are, I am available anytime on email to answer questions. I know that they might pop up at at a later stage. Great. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much again, Greg. Thank you, Gary. Um, I've got no thank other you guys. Uh, and we'll bring this session to a close. And thank you for, for everyone for listening. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank Have you. a good evening, everybody. Bye bye. Thank, thank you. you.